Hi everybody, welcome. This is Joe Minardi and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some of the decision making in first trimester pregnancy using clinical ultrasound. As we know, this is something that we see a lot and often we talk about finding an intrauterine pregnancy, yes or no. And what I hope to talk to you about today is going a little bit beyond that so you can make some more advanced decisions and tailor your patient care with a little more finesse. So uh, with that said, let's just jump right in, okay? Overall, these cases are pretty easy. There are basically three ways these people present. They typically present with pelvic pain, vaginal bleeding, maybe they have both of those things, and then the last thing is they may present in shock, and that's usually when we're talking about a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So, and that's the least common, and usually those we have a little more clues. But, so really it's pelvic pain, and or vaginal bleeding, and then lastly, patients who present in shock. And there's really just a few ultrasound findings that we're trying to figure out to try to elicit these things when we do our ultrasound. So the first thing, do they have a properly placed intrauterine pregnancy? And then if we find that, we wanna look at dates and cardiac activity. We're looking for any abnormal adnexal masses, specifically complex ones, or things that might look like an ectopic. And we're looking for peritoneal fluid. It's common to have a small amount of simple pelvic fluid, uh, but a large amount, especially of complex peritoneal fluid that should raise our red flags for a possible ruptured ectopic. And then there's really just a few primary diagnoses. So I hope you see that this is all actually relatively simple. Just a few presentations, a few findings we're looking for on ultrasound and then a pretty short list of diagnoses that we're going to make and so the diagnosis a normal intrauterine pregnancy hopefully that's what we find most of the time then signs of an ectopic pregnancy and that may be with or without signs of rupture and then we have this whole category of pregnancy of undetermined location we'll talk about that a little bit more but that's basically when you can't find evidence of a pregnancy anywhere so you're just not sure where it is has it been miscarried is it ectopic is it normal and it's just early and then there's the pregnancy with the unclear or probably poor prognosis and we'll talk a little bit about that and that's the one i think that probably scares people a little bit more but i think once we're using this powerful tool of ultrasound and we can see and recognize the findings of a pregnancy with poor prognosis it's really on us it's our responsibility to recognize those findings and be able to have the honest conversation with your patient about mm, things really don't look very good here it's not the most fun conversation in the world it's probably one of the least fun conversations you can have but with the great powerful tool of ultrasound like spider-man would say comes some great responsibility so here we go and then like i said there's a few simple presentations, a few simple findings, a few simple diagnoses, and there's really only three dispositions that you're going to do with these patients. A lot of them, most of the time, if we're going to find normal things, uh, even a lot of the abnormal things that we find, these patients can be discharged. And most of the time, they can wait a week before they get seen again. I remember I was taught way back in medical school and residency, they all needed a 48-hour HCG and need to be rechecked in 48 hours. However, if you're doing an ultrasound that includes all the findings of the adnexa and looking for peritoneal fluid, including the uterus, looking for intrauterine pregnancy and you've seen all those things there's really nothing that's going to change in less than a week's time that that patient needs to come back for unless they have new or a change in their symptoms and of course you need to counsel them on what to come back for and then the other dispositions are you're, they're either someone who's a candidate for medical therapy for ectopic pregnancy or they're someone who needs surgical therapy for an ectopic pregnancy in both of these cases you're at least going to talk to your ob gyn folks probably going to talk to them always for the surgical patients and most of the time you're probably going to at least have a phone conversation if not an ned consult for the medical therapy Therapy for ectopic pregnancy. So that's it. Simple presentation, simple ultrasound findings, short list of diagnoses, and short list of dispositions. That's what we're going to go through. And yeah, there's our little disclaimer about discharge. So we're just going to jump right into the first case. So here we go. Here's our case one. So this is a 24-year-old female who comes in with vaginal bleeding. She's got some lower abdominal cramps and her period's been irregular. So she has really no idea when her period's supposed to be. Is this just her period? What's going on? And so like we always do, we got to start with basic things, give a good history, do it a good exam. Well, she has no past medical history. She's not been on any fertility treatment. That's a very important question to always ask these patients. ABCs are good, so she's stable, she's not going to die here immediately, it doesn't look like. And uh, she has some lower abdominal tenderness, so clearly now we know that what the answer is, right? So what's next? Well, what we're going to do first, we haven't even done a pelvic exam, but we're going to do a transabdominal ultrasound, because if you do things the right way, 
you walked in the room, you saw on the, the chart the chief complaint was female with pelvic symptoms. So you walked in with the ultrasound right at the beginning of your history and physical, so you can do the ultrasound right there while you're in the room. So why? Do it with the initial HMP, you're gonna save you time, gives you a big picture overview of what's going on, you can look for peritoneal fluid, you might be able to see evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy already, and sometimes you'll get lucky and get good views of the adnexa as well. But you can drastically change your differential in the course of your care by incorporating that ultrasound very early and starting with the transabdominal. can risk stratify these patients. If you see no intrauterine pregnancy and a lot of blood and the patient knows they're pregnant, then that's probably an ectopic and you can move your resources in that right direction. Also, if you take a quick look early on and you see a fetus in the right place and it's got a heartbeat, you can reassure that patient quickly and that changes their whole outlook on the rest of that ED visit for the rest of the time that they're there with you. Peritoneal fluid, we talked about that already, so I'm going to go through a couple of reminders about things that you need to just remember when you're doing ultrasound. Basic stuff, so we're going to use a curvilinear or phased array probe for the transabdominal. We're going to make sure that we're in an obstetric setting because otherwise our measurements like fetal heart rate and dates, they aren't going to work, so it's an OB setting. Patient should be supine. I recommend usually doing pregnancy ultrasound on female patients, however, not like this male that's pictured here. A few other things, I usually like to start transverse and pretty good compression right over top of the bladder, so find the bladder first, and then you want to identify the uterus from the fundus all the way down to the cervix, and then remember to use the iliacs, those are pretty useful uh, landmarks to help you out. So okay, this is back to our patient, so these are her transabdominal ultrasound findings. So here's a sagittal view of the uterus, we see the bladder here. This is the uterus, up here is the fundus, this is the endometrial stripe, there's the body of the uterus, and down here is the cervix, and I don't see anything in there. This is a transverse view, the bladder sits on top, and then here we see the uterus behind, nothing that I see inside that uterus. A few other things, so we got a decent look at her right ovary, and I don't see anything obvious, there might be a little simple cyst there. Over here on the left, here's her left ovary, looks pretty normal. That's the uterus here. We did uh, look at the rest of her abdomen for any free fluid. At least here in this view in Morrison's pouch, we don't see any, and I will tell you that the rest of her ultrasound was negative for any significant peritoneal free fluid. So what's our diagnosis? Well, right now it's indeterminate. Right now it's pregnancy of undetermined location, but we're not done yet, so we're gonna keep moving. So we move right on through. We do the pelvic exam and there's a small amount of blood at her cervical os. The cervix is closed. She's got diffuse tenderness. There's no obvious masses on exam. So what's next? What do you think is next? What else would I be talking about? Pelvic ultrasound. Reminders of why will you do transvaginal pelvic ultrasound. It's higher frequency. It's closer to the anatomy. It just gives us better pictures and helps us make uh, more specific diagnoses. Reminders. Obviously, we're going to use the endocavitary transducer. We're going to have it in an OB setting. That's, that's a big area that people forget and can lead them to problems. Patient should be in the dorsal lithotomy position, so this is usually you just pair this right with your pelvic exam. You can do them together and be more efficient that way. Ideally, you want to have an empty bladder, so try to have them before they do the pelvic exam, say go ahead and empty your bladder and we'll do the pelvic exam. Then you're going to identify landmarks such as the bladder. Make sure you see the uterus from the fundus all the way to the cervix. Another common mistake is cutting off or missing part of the, the fundus, the upper part of the, the uterus. Identify the iliacs, those are great landmarks to help you find the ovaries and the adnexal structures. And make sure you're looking for free pelvic fluid as well. So on this patient, we see these transvaginal findings. So uterine fundus, we see the border all the way up here. We see the endometrial stripe kind of opens up until we see this looks like intrauterine gestational sac and within it we see a nice little yolk sac. And here's just a little zoomed in picture, gestational sac, decidual reaction around it, double decidual sign, and then some little inkling of a fetus inside there. And we get looks at her ovaries, right side looks normal, normal looking ovary, left side looks normal. Of course we did nice complete sweeps through these areas to make sure that we didn't see anything concerning and all we really found were normal ovaries. So I have a few questions for you. These are questions that you need to be asking yourself as you're taking a look at this patient. So is there a pregnancy? Yeah, I think we saw one. Is it in the right place? Look like it was right pretty much in the middle of the uterus. It was towards the fundus. It was central. The endometrial stripe seemed to be aligned along the outside of that pregnancy. So it was probably pretty good. What's the gestational age? Uh, we didn't get to that yet, but looked around six weeks maybe. Is there a heartbeat? What's the rate? Well, we haven't gotten to that yet either. What do you see in the adnexa? Well, we really just saw normal ovaries in this patient. And is there excessive or complex free fluid? So these are all things as you're doing the ultrasound, evaluating the patient, 
you need to ask yourself and elicit these findings with your ultrasound. So here we have a gestational sac measurement. We've actually done several of these and we get an estimate of five weeks and three days, pretty early. And then we were able to toss the M-mode across there and actually pick up some fetal cardiac activity and we calculate a heart rate of 124. So those are important things. Those are very reassuring findings and it's good to let the patient know that. And I also, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but measure the dates, especially when you're doing these early pregnancy evaluations. The earlier you measure the dates, the more accurate they're gonna be. So, and you're often gonna be one of the first people to measure them. So when you get these dates, measure them and document them from the early ultrasound. All right, so I told you that the list of possible diagnoses is a pretty short list. So what's the diagnosis in this case? Take a look, tell me what you think. So this one's easy. We started off with a little lob ball. This is a normal intrauterine pregnancy, okay? So let's review the findings really quick. Transabdominally, we didn't really see anything, so I'm gonna go through that quickly. There was no free fluid. Everything looked pretty normal. No pregnancy was seen, but with the transvaginal, we were able to see some better details, and we saw a normal, very early intrauterine pregnancy, but early enough that we could even see cardiac activity, and the adnexa looked normal. So the findings that we're looking for, remember, intrauterine pregnancy, excessive or complex free fluid, adnexal masses. Those are the findings that we're looking to either rule in or rule out with our ultrasound. And just again, reviewing, we found some dates and we were able to find cardiac activity. So the summary of this ultrasound interpretation would be a normally placed intrauterine pregnancy and we measured it five weeks and three days by gestational sac measurements. There are other ways that we can do the date measurements but that's what we used here. Fetal heart rate is 124, no significant free fluid and no obvious adnexal masses. So these are all normal things. This patient can probably go home shortly. Maybe we want to check out the blood type and see if they're a Rogam candidate or not. All right so what's the plan? Here are our choices. Take a look at these and see what you think. Got it, got your answer? All right, so discharge home, repeat ultrasound in a week. Probably not necessary. There's nothing here concerning for ectopic. This patient's low risk. They're not on fertility treatment. Unless they have new symptoms, an ultrasound in a week isn't really gonna change anything. Uh, medical therapy for ectopic, well, hopefully, don't please don't do that. Don't, that, don't kill their fetus and operative therapy, well it's not ectopic, so these are both out. Discharge home, follow up for new OB appointment, roughly 12 weeks, that's probably reasonable. There's nothing else apparently abnormal with this pregnancy so far, so really they don't need to be seen again until their first OB appointment, which is usually around 12 weeks of gestation, unless they have new symptoms or problems. Discharge with guidance for likely miscarriage, well not in this case, let them know that when you're having bleeding or symptoms, there's still a risk, but let them know that nothing that you see here indicates an, an impending miscarriage. So the right answer right there. They're, they don't need to be seen again for uh, at least six more weeks unless they have new symptoms or problems. So let's just talk about that a little bit. So part of doing all this, you know, we're talking a lot about the ultrasound, but make sure you do a careful history and physical. So look for risk factors for ectopic, fertility treatment also. Do a systematic ultrasound that includes transvaginal images and includes views of the adnexa and make sure you see the ovaries in the adnexa well and scan all the way through them until they disappear in both directions. Answer some of these important clinical questions and you can tailor decisions and guide your patients and give them the best advice that you can. So summary of this patient, they have a properly placed IUP, negative adnexa, negative free fluid, they are low risk and discharge is perfectly appropriate. All right, so let's move on to the next case and here's what I'm gonna tell you. It's all the same because they all present with plus or minus mostly similar symptoms, right? Exam is the same, so we'll jump right into the ultrasound. Transabdominally, we don't see anything again. Looks pretty normal. No significant free fluid. Adnexa look pretty normal. Transabdominally, so we're gonna move into the transvaginal study. All right, so here's a sagittal view of the uterus. Here's the endometrial stripe. These are just some Nebothian cysts, nothing to worry about there. Here's a coronal view of the uterus, and we're gonna get looks at the adnexa, the right ovaries out here, looks pretty normal. Of course, we scanned all the way through that, didn't see anything. Left ovary is actually sitting right there next to the uterus, the iliac vessels are here. We scan all the way through, looks normal, we don't see anything, including we don't see an intrauterine pregnancy. So there's no intrauterine pregnancy, no significant free fluid, and no obvious adnexal masses. HCG, 684. Think about what that might mean. All right, what's our diagnosis here? This is pregnancy of undetermined location. It's indeterminate. You can't rule out ectopic, can't rule out miscarriage, 
can't rule out this is just normal. Our interpretation, we talked about this already, no IUP, no significant free fluid, no obvious adnexal masses. So this is a low risk ultrasound, okay? This is a patient who ectopic is not excluded, but they are low risk. If the ectopic is not big enough to see anything at all, it is not likely to rupture in the next couple of days and they're not going to die on you unexpectedly. That'd be an incredibly unlikely. So even though we don't know where the pregnancy is, we have a low risk ultrasound. This patient's still okay to go home. So kind of alluded to this already. What's our plan? We're going to discharge this patient home, repeat, in one week. No need to do this in 48 hours. Nothing is going to change in 48 hours unless they have new symptoms. It's going to take at least a week for the fetus, if it's there, to grow to a size big enough for us to see either in the uterus or in the adnexa if it's an ectopic. So follow up in a week unless new symptoms come up. So just to discuss that a little bit, this patient had a low risk history and physical, right? They weren't on fertility treatment. They didn't have a lot of risk factors. Their ultrasound was indeterminate, showed no pregnancy, but there it was low risk. We got good views of the adnexa. We didn't see a lot of free fluid. And their HCG is in that low range where uh, it's very possible there's just a small pregnancy that's not big enough to see. So really have to emphasize this. If you're going to tell them to wait a week, which I think is perfectly fine and appropriate, just make sure they have good instructions and they're fairly reliable. So if they have worse pain, worse bleeding, dizziness, they pass out. If they um, try to die at home from hemorrhagic shock, they should come back. Sometimes we're all used to the dogma of the 48-hour recheck and you say, one week, what? But if you've done your job, you've done the complete ultrasound, you've scanned all the way through the adnexa on both sides, you've looked for free fluid, you've seen all of the uterus, there is no need to do a 48-hour HCG. It's not going to change anything in your plan. Nobody's going to do surgery, and nobody's going to call this a, um, an ectopic or a miscarriage in 48 hours. So have them wait at least a week. Moving right along to our next case, and um, same history, same exam, moving right into the ultrasound. Transabdominally looks pretty good. There's no free fluid. The adnexa and the ovaries look okay. Moving into our transvaginal, there's nothing we see in the uterus here or here. Left ovary uh, looks pretty normal. Here's the right ovary though. Left was right here by the uterus. On the right we see, what's this look like? So this looks like, looks kind of like a gestational sac with a yolk sac, kind of a thick rim around it, some blood flow around. So what is this? This, this is called a tubal ring. So this is a sign of a subtle ectopic pregnancy. So no intrauterine pregnancy, no significant free fluid, but a mass in the right adnexa consistent with ectopic. So what's our diagnosis here? So likely ectopic without signs of rupture, and it's pretty small. And that's important if we're trying to decide between medical versus surgical therapy. And again, once you're doing the ultrasound, which we're all doing, we're all capable of doing, we need to be thinking ahead about what's this patient a candidate for this will help inform our decisions our discussions with our patients and our discussions with our consultants and follow-up plans so a plan here because this is a small ectopic pregnancy without signs of rupture this is someone who may be a candidate for medical therapy for ectopic pregnancy now there's a few other caveats that we're going to talk about so medical therapy for ectopic the indications are so like a lot of these things the patient's got to be stable and reliable their ectopic needs to be small so you got to measure the borders of that ectopic pregnancy and it should be less than three and a half centimeters and if you have any question about that take several pictures and several measurements in different planes no signs of rupture so that's why it's very important to look for the free fluid all over in the pelvis and up in the upper abdomen generally the fetus shouldn't have heart tones and the hcg should be less than five thousands these are considered to be pretty much contraindications to medical therapy as well because these are thought to be just bigger and higher risk for rupture and higher risk to fail medical therapy. Obviously the contraindications of the patient's unstable, they've got signs of rupture, and if they've got signs of cardiac activity or a high HCG, medical therapy is not likely to work and they still have a good chance of rupture, so these are reasons not to do medical therapy. So our patient, she meets all these, so she's a good candidate for medical therapy. And this is just another time, I'm going to say it again, doing the whole ultrasound, looking at the adnexa, looking for the free fluid, allows you to make more tailored and better management decisions for your patient and helps you inform the patients of what's going to happen, what they need to do, and informs your decisions with, in your discussions with your consultants. So you might need to think about that a little bit, so I'll let you ponder that.